Thanks for talk of uh, Darwin Day. So we've talked on a lot of different things. Again, just told us a little bit about perception and neuroscience. We've talked about biology, geology, astronomy, and everything in between. So this is all explaining how evolution is relevant in lots of different scientific areas, right? But for a very long time, a lot of people, some who may have been critical of Darwin and the idea of evolution in general, they would always kind of stipulate, well, evolution doesn't explain how humans get their morals, perhaps why we behave the way we do to each other, why we treat other people the way we do. But increasing evidence is actually showing that evolution can actually answer a lot of the questions relating to these very sensitive topics. And our final speaker is going to tell us all about that, Dr. Alan Freeberg. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, well, there's no way I'm going to be anywhere near as entertaining as that last guy. <laughs> Alright, so I'm going to be talking about evolution, I mean evolution in a Darwinian sense, and we'll be talking about the human brain, and that includes all aspects of the human brain. Your personality, your attitude, your feelings, your capabilities, and your morality. And maybe who, did, who you voted for. <laughs> okay, this is based upon this particular book called The Blank Slate, written by uh, Steven Pinker, who's a very famous uh, neurobiologist, neuroscientist at Harvard. And so this presentation is going to be basically a reflection and a summary of that particular book. But he wasn't, by any means, the first guy to come up with this idea. An even more famous man, E.O. Wilson, back in the 60s, came up with this particular idea. Now, you may have seen the show on PBS uh, back in October. They did a two-hour documentary on the life of E.O. Wilson and his work. And uh, he's the kind of guy, you, you just can't help but love the guy. I mean, he's a... Uh, Good evening, Mr. Richards. The time is now 4.30, and the team in the store will be closing just 30 minutes. He's a, he's he's a, a very... very he's, you next time. <laughs> he's a very mild-mannered, soft-spoken southern gentleman who's also a professor of biology at Harvard. <clears throat> Back in the 60s, he came up with this idea that he called sociobiology. And uh, as a result, this was probably the worst time he could have ever come up with this idea, but as a result, many of his lectures had protesters, people marching around with signs, decrying the stuff that he was talking about. He was shouted down at meetings. He was physically attacked on one occasion. So it turns out to be a, a fairly dangerous idea. So what is this dangerous idea? Well, it's this. <clears throat> the human mind is shaped as much by genetics as it is by our environment, our culture, our parents, and so on. And that means that there's limitations as to how much we can do to change human behavior. Now, if you think about that for a minute, you can see that can be a very dangerous idea. And some of this can lead to some really, really sensitive issues. I'm hoping to avoid most of those, but I think you can, as you see this, you can follow along with that. So what I'd like you to do, before you start throwing rocks and tomatoes at me, I'd like you to consider the world is not necessarily the way we like it to be. We have to make the best of the way the world really is. And how do we determine how the world really is? The best answer is, of course, science. Science provides us the very best estimates. Sometimes it's wrong, but it self-corrects. Sometimes it doesn't have all the answers, but eventually it gets better and better. So it provides us the very best information upon which to make our decisions about how the world is and what we should do about it. Now, sometimes people don't like what science tells us. For example, today, there's a lot of people out there denying climate change because they don't like the idea of big government telling people what to do. So they attack the science. And that's really not, that's really not appropriate. The science is what it is. You can argue about what we should do about it, but they attack the science. The stuff I'm going to be talking about here today is more likely to um, offend the people at the other end of the political spectrum, like myself, <laughs> people who are educators and things of that sort. But again, as you see, as you listen to this, keep that in mind. The world 
world's not necessarily where we want it to be. We have to make the best of it, and science gives us the best information. Okay, I don't think I need to go through this chart in any detail. This is evolution, of course. Now, the part of evolution that's important to us is that. Because that critter right there, that's us. <coughs> but, from the standpoint of the gene, which is what's really driving its, uh, evolution, that's really nothing more than a copying machine. And if the gene, if the set of genes do a good job of making a good copying machine, they'll get more copies of themselves into future generations. And if it's not so good, then there won't be any copies. Now, a lot of people like to separate evolution from, from the idea of God and say, well, they've got to be two different things, but it's quite possible for any religion to incorporate the science that we know, and this is one example of how they could do that. All right, I want to begin by talking about how genes can be programmed, can program our brains in exquisite detail. And I'll begin with a very simple example. You've all seen that kind of behavior before. The little duckling critters follow along behind the mother. At birth, they do something called imprinting, where they immediately attach themselves to the mother, emotionally perhaps, but anyhow, they stay really close to the mother. And they follow along in that nice little line. Nobody teaches those ducklings to do that. The mother doesn't instruct them on that, in that regard. They immediately experience something that we would probably call love for the mother. And they stay very, very close to her. An even more amazing experiment was done back in the 50s, where somebody took a bunch of these little ducklings, I guess goslings is probably the right word, and put them in some sort of an enclosure. And they pass that silhouette that you see over their head, a cardboard cutout like that. And if you pass it from left to right, it looks kind of like a hawk, short head, long tail. And the little goslings immediately would rush and huddle up against the mother or hide in the corner, exhibiting something we would probably call fear. But, ah, But if you pass that image over them in the other direction, which they did, it kind of looks like a goose that is going from right to left. Long neck, short tail. And the goslings exhibited no change in their behavior. Now think what that means. Buried somewhere deep in the mind of those baby ducks at birth is that image. Somehow the genes have programmed that, those ducklings' minds to have that image and to know to be afraid of it. Okay, what about human beings? <clears throat> this, of course, is the old nature versus nurture issue that people always talk about. Nature being what we inherit, genetics, basically, and nurture being everything else. Parents, environment, culture, and so on. <clears throat> well, one of the ways we can separate these things out is by looking at identical twins and siblings because identical twins have exactly the same set of genes, but often through unfortunate circumstances, sometimes end up in different environments. So you can look at there and see how similar they are, or how different they are, and get some kind of an idea of how much is genetics and how much is environment. Similarly with siblings, they contain half the same set of genes, so you can also make some assumptions from that. Um, you can look at behaviors or emotions that are common across all societies, and there are many things like that. The fact that we cry, that we laugh, that we love our children, things of this sort. Um, behaviors or emotions that appear to exist at birth. For example, who got that baby to smile? Where did that come from? Or to cry? It's something we call an instinctive behavior. Well, what does that mean? That means that already in the mind of that baby is the, the, uh, the, the information that says, hey, if somebody tickles me, that's going to feel good. 
already some brain processing there. But also, I'm going to change all the muscles in my face in such a way to make that cute little smile. Or to cry if it's the other way around. And lastly, <coughs> behaviors or emotions that appear to make sense from an evolutionary perspective. It's the first thing that biologists do when they discover a new organism or a new feature of an organism. They'll look to see how does this help get more of its genes into the next generation. Very common thing to be doing. <coughs> Continuing, human brains. Some examples of some of those things. Fraternal sexual relations. Ooh. Ugh, we all hate that idea. It's a big taboo. Why? Why do we hate that idea so much? Because it makes very poor sense from an evolutionary standpoint. A brother and a sister can have both have recessive genes, and any progeny produced will have a really tough time surviving. And so in every society, this is a taboo. What's your best predictor for having a cognitive or an emotional disorder? Even a minor one. The very best predictor is if you happen to have an identical twin who's got it. Because they carry the exact same genes. Doesn't matter whether you're raised in the same environment or not. But if you have an identical twin who's got those genes and has that particular disorder, the odds are better than average that you will have it as well. Similarly, homosexuality or left-handedness, again, strong brain functions. The odds are, if your twin has it, you have a better than average chance that you'll have it. So how do the genes do this? Well, <clears throat> one way they do it, in, in addition to the basic structure, is the fact that they produce all these chemicals in our brain that have all these uh, effects on uh, the way we act. <clears throat> There's a list of some of them. Testosterone, estrogen being the male and female hormones, we all have some degree of each of those. Oxytocin, that's the great one. The love hormone, the thing that makes us fall in love, the thing that makes mothers bond immediately with their babies. And oh, by the way, it's accompanied by opiates that get released in the brain. It feels good to fall in love. Now, people have been studying the human genome for some time, and we've discovered 30-some thousand genes. Nobody knows what all these things do by any means. Hardly any of them we know what they do. But we do know some of them. For example, this particular gene is connected to a speech disorder. This particular gene is associated with spatial cognition, perhaps explaining why men like to look at maps and women like to look at landmarks. Um, this gene, and this could be a very sensitive issue, is related to general intelligence. Now, it is believed that there are probably thousands of genes that are related to intelligence. This one has a very small effect, but it has been statistically significantly shown to affect intelligence. So whether you have it or not, has something to do with your intelligence. This one involves thrill-seeking. So maybe why you like to ride a roller coaster relates to your genetics. And there's been a bunch of studies that have linked that, uh, linked that particular gene to depression and low self-esteem. So maybe the reason you have depression or low self-esteem isn't because your mother didn't love you enough as a child. Perhaps it's because your mother gave you those particular genes. It's as though at birth we come uh, with a bunch of settings, if you will, for various brain attributes. And you can make your own list up here. But um, each one of these has a particular setting that we have at birth. That's what the needles on those little dials are. Now, as life goes on, your parents, your culture, your religion, your friends, your peers, or anything, can begin to change the position of those dials. In some cases, you can change them very easily. Sometimes it's a much more difficult change. But nevertheless, they can't be changed. But the point here is that we have initial settings. Now, all of you've, um, you, you, first thing you think about when you think of evolution is, you know, nature red and bloody and tooth and claw. You want the 
biggest, meanest lion is going to get the most meat and pass on the most genes to the next generation, and so on. How is it that this process can produce goodness? And yet we all know there's a lot of goodness in people. We all do a lot of good things. How, um, I'm sure most of you, or many of you, have gone to some strange city. You go into a restaurant, you're never going to be in this city again. You have a nice dinner, waiter brings you the bill, you pay the bill, you leave a tip. Why do you do that? You're never going to see that waiter again. Why do you feel guilty if you don't do that? It makes absolutely no economic sense whatsoever. It makes absolutely no evolutionary sense whatsoever. At least it doesn't seem like it. A more extreme example. Why does that fireman rush into the building to save some stranger's baby, or maybe even a dog? Or why does the guy jump into the pond to save the, some stranger's child that's drowning? These are referred to as altruistic acts. And at first they seem to make absolutely no sense from an evolutionary point of view. How is it that these good deeds can arise from a process that would want, would, would that involves our selfish genes. It wouldn't seem like it would be possible. What we have to remember is that we evolved in an environment quite different from the environment we live in today. We evolved in an environment of small hunter-gatherer tribes. And you can go even further back to even before we were human. But in those tribes, the most important thing Hello, Discovery visitors. The time is now 4.45, and the Discovery and the Museum Store will be closing in 15 minutes. Thank you for visiting the Discovery. The most important thing in that, in that primitive environment that had the most impact on whether or not we were going to get our genes into the next generation were the other people in our tribe. They determined whether we got fed, who we married, things of this sort that had tremendous impact on whether we got any genes into the next generation. And so, <clears throat> first of all, and, and also, we were related to many of these people. These little tribes would tend to be rather inbred. Now, if you're related to somebody, they're carrying some of the same genes you have. And so, if you help them, you're helping get some of the same kind of genes you have into the next generation. And if you're helping a brother or sister or child, they have half of your genes. If you're helping a nephew or niece, they have a quarter. If you're helping a cousin, they have an eighth. Isn't it interesting, too, that that's just about the same proportions that we care about these people in? <laughs> at least at first. <laughs> and again, one could argue that more than likely nature has programmed our brains that way. But in any event, this is called kin selection. And it's also the, the start of why we might perform altruistic acts. But there's another thing. <laughs> your reputation in a small group of people that you're going to live with for your entire life is unbelievably important. If I kill a, a, a buffalo today and you're starving and I feed your family, hey, I'm a nice guy. You're going to think well of me. Two weeks later, you may give me some meat when I'm going hungry. Or a month later, you might be able to let me sleep with your daughter. <laughs> you know, in any event, I'm going to get past genes on to the next generation because I'm a good guy. If I'm a bad guy, the big old mean guy who beats everybody up, takes all the women, I may wake up tomorrow morning with a spear on my side. So, increasing your status is unbelievably important in that primitive world we lived in before. Today, when we meet so many people we never see again, not so much, but we still carry that evolutionary idea in our brain. And lastly, there's just the idea of simple economic exchange. If I make better spears and you make better axes, I make a spear today, you're my buddy, I give you one. A couple weeks later, you'll make an axe, you'll give me one. Because we like each other. It's not a zero-sum game. Again, this is the nature versus nurture argument. Many years ago, back in the 19th century, everyone believed it was human na nature that was the most important thing, genetics. You had to be of good breeding to be in the upper class. And if you weren't in the upper class, 
you were very much discriminated against. Well, this part reached a, a peak, if you will, during the eugenics period, the early 20th century, and of course, the atrocities of World War II. And then, of course, there was a big, the pendulum swung way over to the other side, to the point where in the 60s, we thought everything was nature. We're all these blank slates. This is what's, why Stephen Pinker titled his book this way. We're all these blank slates that are lit upon by our parenting and our society and our culture. And you know, this was a time when they thought, oh, we'll just give, we'll give little girls trucks and they'll all become great engineers, or we'll give little boys dolls, and we'll train them to become very motherly, loving, giving people. And of course, that really didn't work. <coughs> and, uh, but we are sort of still stuck with this from the 60s, because many of the people who were teaching back then, or educated back then, grew up back then, like myself, um, we adopted this attitude that we are these blank slates, and we'd like it to be that way, but it's not. <clears throat> and Steven Pinker goes on about this quite a bit, the fact that we don't want to admit that there is a genetic component to what we are. Some examples. Teenagers who play violent video games are more likely to commit violent crimes. Well, hell, we've got to take those video games away from those kids. That's terrible. But wait a minute, how did they figure that out? Somebody did a survey where they looked at violent criminals and they checked out, asked them probably, did you play violent video games? And they found there's a correlation between those two things. A correlation is not a cause and effect relationship. You can just as easily turn that statement around and then you're gonna say that the people who are violent criminals are more likely to play violent video games. And yet this is common knowledge today. Everybody seems to think that's the case. You can't do that experiment. The only way you can do that experiment is take a bunch of randomly separate, random people, separate them into two groups, force one group to play violent video games, prevent the other group from playing violent video games, playing violent video games, and see how they turn out. And that's an unethical experiment, probably illegal too. Inside that you wouldn't get any subjects, but... <laughs> So anyhow, this is an example of a correlation. And people commonly do this all the time. It does not imply a cause and effect relationship. It may very well be that the cause <coughs> is the fact that there's something totally different. These people have a violent nature, maybe genetically, maybe because of their parenting, whatever. But because of that, they like violent video games and they like to commit violent crimes. Okay, another example. Use it or lose it. You've got to educate your brain and you won't get dementia when you get older. That's a very common thing that people talk about all the time too. But again, think about it. How would you know that? Unless you took a group of people, separated them randomly into two groups, educated one group and not the other group, and saw which ones get dementia, you would have no way to prove that. Maybe brains that are more active, that like to get educated, also last longer. They have nothing to do with the fact they did get educated. Um, Discover Magazine is not a scientific journal, but they do a reasonably good job of reporting the science. You'll notice that word suggesting in there. Probably most of you read right over that word. And certainly lots of people do that. The news media does that a lot too. Uh, and Steven Pinker likes to rail against what he calls the parenting advice industrial complex, because they do this all the time. They've got all these rules about how you should do your parenting based upon scientific tests, but the tests all turn out to be correlations like this. They're often wrong, you can't verify them from the data because they don't control for heredity. That is what they inherit. For example, surround your kid with books. Make him better readers. People even read to the babies in utero. <laughs> All right, well, is it really the fact that the kid's surrounded by books, or is it possible that the same genes that you have 
that make you love books, like, be it, like education, like to be around books, that you pass on to your children and therefore they do it. We never think about that aspect of it. <coughs> so anyhow, in genetically controlled studies of siblings, siblings separated at birth, about the same as those raised together. Adopted siblings have very little similarity. Now I'm sure every one of you are thinking about specific examples in your mind right now where, which are not covered by this. <coughs> Remember, it's not Can each individual case. You have to look at large groups of people and statistics. Hope you have enjoyed the museum today and that you'll visit <coughs> Discovery again soon. And there are millions of examples. Stephen Pinker has many in his book. I can go through them now, but where identical twins are shown to have extreme similarity. Many times they meet much later in life, they haven't even known each other, and they find out that you know, they vote for the same party, drink the same coffee, watch the same TV, smoke the same cigarettes, and on and on and on. Okay, so why is it people don't like this idea, uh, they want to embrace this idea of a blank slate? Why do they not want to feel as though there is some inheritance involved here? First of all is the issue of genetic predisposition, predestination. But it isn't really predestination, it's predisposition. It can change. <coughs> Eugenics and class societies. We in America especially don't like the idea of class societies. And so the idea that we genetically, our brains are modified, are controlled to some extent by the genes we inherit. <coughs> we don't like that idea. Equality. This is America. All men are created equal. Except we know they aren't, really. <clears throat> What's really important, of course, is that they have equal rights, equal opportunities, and so on. And feminism. This is one where they start throwing <coughs> at me. Um, you know, there are differences in the organs of men and women. Not only the organs, but the size <coughs> of the organs. Now, nobody seems terribly upset about the fact that there are no women playing football in the National Football League. But yet, somehow we expect that there ought to be just as many CEOs that are women as there are men. And we must be discriminated against them. <coughs> but our brains are different too. And women have other interests. Continuing, here's the real, here's the real biggie. <coughs> responsibility. If our genes are predisposing us to certain things, are we really responsible? He raped that woman because he was genetically programmed with a strong sex drive or a violent nature. That's genetic determinism. <coughs> do we let the guy off the hook? Well, no, I wouldn't think so. But do we take that into account? Well, maybe. But how different is that from his environment? How about if he raped that woman because his mother beat him as a child and <coughs> so hates women? He's no more responsible for who his mother was than what his genes were. So it's still the same problem. It does remove a little bit of the responsibility. I'm not saying we let these people go free by any means. Okay, social reform, I'm almost at the very end. Social reform, that's the other thing. Most of us <coughs> educators like to think all kids can be educated to the point where everybody's above average. And of course, that can't be the case either. So in summary, Evolution has acted on our brains, as well as our bodies, and that means our attitudes, our personalities, and our morality. We are not the blank slates we'd like to think we are. And to improve our society, we have to recognize this. Taking away all those video games may not solve our problem.